Chapter One of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. The Return of the Wanderers. I never thought I could be so glad to be anywhere except home, thought Molly Brown as she swung off the bus, and, seizing her suitcase, ran into Queen's Cottage without so much as ringing the bell. Two juniors whom Molly had known only by sight the year before, and several freshmen, had been in the Wellington omnibus. No one in whom she could confide her enthusiasm as the bus turned a bend in the road and Wellington's towers came into view. Molly, Molly! cried a voice from somewhere in the upper regions of Queens, and down three flights of stairs rushed a wild figure, her fluffy light brown hair standing out all over her head, and her voluminous kimono sailing behind her like the tail of a kite. Oh, Judy, it's good to see you again, cried Molly, and the two girls were instantly folded in each other's arms in a long, loving embrace. You remind me strongly of Meg Merrilies, continued Molly, holding her friend off at arm's length and giving her a joyful little shake. You look as if you had been running over the moors in the wind. You'd think I was a bit daffy if you could see my room, replied Julia Keene, who, those of you who have met her in an earlier story will recall, was nicknamed Judy by her friends. I'm unpacking. It looks like the world in the era of chaos. Mountains of clothes and islands of shoes and archipelagos of hats all jumbled into a hopeless mass. But never mind that now. Let's talk about each other. Come on upstairs. Your room's ready. I looked in half an hour ago. You've got new wallpaper and a fresh coat of paint. That's because you are one of Mrs. Markham's little pets. Really, cried Molly, delighted. How charmed Nance will be. And I've brought some white dimity curtains with ruffled edges to hang at the windows. I made them last summer when it was 98 in the shade. Where is Nance, by the way? And where are all the Queen's girls, and what new ones are here? One at a time, Miss Brown, laughed Judy, following Molly up to the third story and into the large room shared by Molly and her friend Nance Oldham. How sweet it's going to look, cried Molly, clasping her hands and gazing around her with all the ardor of a returned wanderer. But where is Nance? Judy's face became very grave. Is it possible you haven't heard the news about Nance? she said. Judy, what do you mean? cried Molly, taking off her hat and running her fingers through her rumpled auburn hair, a trick she had when she was excited and overwrought. Now, tell me at once what has happened to Nance. How could you have kept it from me? Dear old Nance. Judy blew her nose violently. Why don't you answer me, Judy? Isn't Nance coming back? I haven't heard from her for weeks. Oh, do tell me. I'm going to tell you in a minute, answered Judy. I can't blow my nose and talk at the same time. It's a physical impossibility. I've got a wretched cold, you see. I'm afraid it's going into influenza. Julia Keene, you are keeping something from me. I don't care a rap about your nose. Isn't Nance coming back? Molly almost fell on her knees in the excess of her anxiety. Judy turned her face away from those appealing blue eyes and coughed a forced throaty cough. Suppose I should say she wasn't coming back, Molly. Would you mind it? Would I mind it? repeated Molly, her eyes filling with tears. Suddenly the closet door was flung open and out rushed Nance. Oh, Molly, forgive me, she cried, throwing her arms around her roommate's neck. Judy thought it would be a good practical joke, but I couldn't stand the deception any longer. It was worth it, though, if only to know you would miss me. Miss you, exclaimed Molly. I should think I would. Judy, you wretch. I never did say she wasn't coming, replied Judy. I simply said, is it possible you haven't heard the news about Nance? It shows how your heart rules your head, Molly. You shouldn't take on so until you get at the real truth. Your impetuous nature needs... Here Judy was interrupted by the noise of a headlong rush down the hall. Then the door was burst open and three girls blew into the room, all laughing and talking at once. My goodness, it sounds like a stampede of wild cattle, exclaimed Judy. How are you, old pals? A general all-round embrace followed. It was Margaret Wakefield, last year's class president, 
her chum jessie lynch and sally marks now a senior but not in the least set up by her exalted state where's mabel hinton someone demanded she's moved over to the quadrangle into a singleton she wanted to be nearer the scene of action she said and queen's was too diverting for her serious life's work so margaret explained i'm sorry said molly i'm one of those nice comfortable homebodies that likes the family to keep right on just the same forever but i suppose we can't expect everybody to be as fond of this old brown house as we are sit down everybody she added hospitably and oh yes wait a moment i didn't open this on the train at all she fell on her knees and opened her suitcase while her friends exchanged knowing smiles ruling passion even strong in death observed judy of course it's something good to eat laughed pretty jessie of course replied molly pitching articles of clothing out of her satchel with all the carelessness of one who pursues a single idea at a time and why not my sister made them for me the morning i left and packed them carefully in a tin box with oiled paper cloud bursts they cried ecstatically and pounced on the box without ceremony while molly who like most good cooks had a small appetite leaned back in a morris chair and regarded them with the pleased satisfaction of a host who has provided satisfactory refreshment for his guests the summer had made few changes in the faces of her last year's friends margaret was a bit taller and more massive and her handsome face a little heavier already her youthful lines were maturing and she might easily have been mistaken for a senior nance was as round and plump as a partridge and there was a new happiness in her face the happiness of returning to the first place she had ever known that in any way resembled a home nance had lived in a boarding house ever since she could remember but queen's was not like a boarding house at least not like the one to which she was accustomed where the boarders consisted of two crusty old bachelors a widow who was hipped about her health and always talked symptoms a spinster who had taught school for thirty years and nance's parents that is one of them and at intervals the other mrs oldham only returned to her family to rest between club conventions and lecture tours judy had a beautiful creamy tan on her face which went admirably with her dreamy gray eyes and soft light brown hair there were times when she looked much like a boy and she did at this moment molly thought with her hair parted on one side and a brilliant roman scarf knotted around her rolling byronic collar jessie just now engaged in the pleasing occupation of smiling at her own image in the mirror over the mantel was as pretty as ever as for sally marks every familiar freckles in its familiar place and as judy remarked later she had changed neither her spots nor her skin she had merely added a pair of eyeglasses to her tip-tilted critical nose and there was perhaps an extra spark of dry humor in her pale eyes molly was a little thin she always fell off after a ninety-eight in the shade summer but she was the same old molly to her friends possessed with an indescribable charm and sweetness the nameless charm it had been called but there were many who could name it as being a certain kindly gentleness and unselfishness what's the news girls she demanded giving a general all-round smile like that of a famous orator which seemed to be meant for everybody at once and no one in particular news is scarce or should i say are replied margaret epimenides antimus green the handsomest man ever seen was offered a chair in one of the big colleges and refused but why cried molly round-eyed with amazement because he has more liberty at wellington and more time to devote to his writings molly walked over to the window to hide a smile the comic opera she thought he's just published a book you know on the elizabethan drama went on margaret which is to be used as a textbook in lots of private schools and he's been on a walking trip through england this summer with george theodore how did you know all that interrupted judy well to tell you the truth i came up to wellington on the train with andy mclean and he answered all the questions i asked him replied margaret laughing i also answered all the questions he asked me about a particular young lady nance pretended to be very busy at this moment with the contents of her work bag the other girls began laughing and she looked up disclosing a scarlet countenance don't you know she never could take a teasing cried judy who's teasing answered margaret no names were mentioned don't you mind nance dear said molly always tender-hearted when it came to teasing 
the rest of us haven't had one inquiring friend as Catlin and i cook used to call him when i wrote letters for her to her family in georgia she always finished up with now miss molly just in with love to all inquiring friends the dainty little french clock on the mantel one of nance's new possessions tinkled five times in a subdued fairy chime and the friends scattered to their various rooms to unpack judy was now in frances andrew's old room next to the one occupied by molly and nance i think i'll take a gimlet and bore a hole through the wall she announced as she lingered a moment after the others had gone so that we can communicate without having to walk ten steps i counted em this morning and opened two doors who has your old room judy inquired molly you'd never guess in a thousand years so i'll have to enlighten you answered judy a young japanese lady for heaven's sake cried molly and nance in one breath while judy who loved a climax sailed from the room without vouchsafing any more information end of chapter one chapter two of molly brown's sophomore days by nell speed this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by debbie r baker robinson otoyo molly and nance were very busy that night arranging their belongings molly's tastes were simple and nance's were what might be called complicated molly had been reared all her life in large spaces big airy rooms and broad halls and the few pieces of heavy old mahogany in them were of the kind that cannot be bought for a song nance had been reared in an atmosphere of oiled walnut and boarding-house bric-a-brac she was learning because she had an exceedingly observing and intelligent mind but she had not learned therefore that night when molly hung the white muslin curtains and spread out the beautiful blue antique rug left by frances andrews she devoutly hoped that nance would go easy with the pictures and ornaments what we want to try to do this year nance she announced from the top of the step ladder is to keep things empty we got fairly messy last winter after christmas i'm going to keep all those banners and things packed this year perhaps i'd better not get out those past per two gibson pictures began nance a little doubtfully just as you like nance dear said molly she would rather have hung the wall with bill posters than have hurt her friend's feelings honestly you aren't fond of them are you asked nance oh it isn't that apologized molly but i think so many small pictures scattered over a big wall space are well rather tiring to the optic nerves nance looked sad but she had unbounded faith in molly's opinions what shall we do with this big empty wall space then she asked pausing in her unpacking to regard a sea of blue-gray cartridge paper with a critical eye at this juncture there came a light timid tap so faint indeed that it might have been the swish of a mouse's tail as he brushed past the door molly paused in her contemplation of blank walls and listened did you hear anything nance she asked i thought i heard a tapping at our chamber door come in called nance briskly the door opened first a mere crack then the space widened and there stood on the threshold the diminutive figure of a little japanese girl who by subsequent measurements proved to be exactly five feet one half an inch in height she was dressed like white people to quote molly that is in a neat cloth suit and a straw turban and her slanting black eyes were like highly polished pieces of ebony i beg the honorable pardon of the young ladies she began with a prim funny accent i arrived this moment which have passing at the honorable home of young ladies i not find no one save serving girl who have informing me of room of sleeping in honorable lady of the house her you calling matronly not in at present passing moment i feeling little frightening you will forgive poor otoyo with an almost superhuman effort molly controlled her face and choked back the laughter that bubbled up irrepressibly nance had buried her head in her trunk until she could retain her composure indeed i do forgive you poor dear you must feel strange and lonely just wait until i get down from the ladder and i'll show you your bedroom 
it used to be the room of one of my best friends so i happen to know it very well molly crawled down from the heights of the stepladder and took the little japanese girl's brown hand in hers shall we not shake hands and be friends she said we are such near neighbors you are just down there at the end of the hall you see my name is brown molly brown and this is my roommate nance oldham i with much pleasure feel to making acquaintance of beautiful young ladies said the japanese girl smiling charmingly and showing two rows of teeth as pointed and white as a spaniel's nance had also risen to the occasion by this time and now shook miss otoyo sen's hand with a great show of cordiality to make up for her crimson face and mouth still and steady with laughter they conducted the japanese girl to her room and turned on the lights there were two new-looking american trunks in the room and two cases covered with matting and inscribed with mystic japanese hieroglyphics wired to the cord wrapping was an express tag with miss o sen queen's cottage wellington written across it in plain handwriting oh exclaimed miss otoyo clasping her hands with timid pleasure my estates have unto this place arriving come nance turned and rushed from the room and molly opened the closet door you can hang all your things in here she said unsteadily and of course lay some of them in the bureau drawers better unpack tonight because tomorrow will be a busy day for you it's the opening day you know if we can help you don't hesitate to ask i am with gratitude much filled up said the little japanese making a low ceremonious bow don't mention it replied molly hastening back to her room she found nance giving vent to noiseless laughter in the morris chair tears were rolling down her cheeks and her face was purple with suppressed amusement molly often said that when nance did laugh she was like the pig who died in clover when he died he died all over when nance succumbed to laughter her entire being was given over to merriment wasn't it beautiful she exclaimed in a low voice did you ever imagine such ludicrous english it was all participles how do you suppose she ever made the entrance examinations oh she's probably good enough at writing it's just speaking that stumps her but wasn't she killingly funny when she said my estates have unto this place arriving come i thought i should have to depart and go along with you but it would have been rude beyond words what a dear little thing she is i think i'll go over later and see how she is america must be polite to her visitors but japan always beforehand in ceremonious politeness was again ahead of america in this respect just before ten o'clock the mouse's tail once more brushed their door and nance's sharp ears catching the faint sound she called come in miss otoyo sen entered this time less timidly but with the same deprecating smile on her diminutive face begging honorable pardon of beautiful young ladies she began will condescendingly to accept unworthy gift from otoyo in gratitude of favors receiving then she produced a beautiful japanese scroll at least four feet in length in the background loomed up the snow-capped peak of the ever-present sacred mountain fujiyama and the foreground disclosed a pleasing combination of sky-blue waters dotted with picturesque little islands connected with graceful curving bridges and here and there were cherry trees aglow with delicate pink blossoms oh how perfectly sweet exclaimed the girls delighted and just the place on this bare wall space continued molly it's really a heaven-sent gift miss sen because we were wishing for something really beautiful to hang over that divan but aren't you robbing yourself no no i beg you assurance otoyo have many suchly it is nothing beautiful young ladies do honor by accepting humbly gift let's hang it at once suggested molly while the stepladder is yet with us queen's stepladder is so much in demand that it's very much like the snowfall in the river a moment there then gone forever the two girls moved the homely but coveted ladder across the room and with much careful shifting and after several suggestions timidly made by otoyo finally hung up the scroll it really glorified the whole room and made a framed lithograph of a tea-drinking lady in a boudoir costume and a kitten that trifled with a ball of yarn on the floor nance's possession 
appear so commonplace that she shamefacedly removed it from its tack and put it back in her trunk to molly's secret relief won't you sit down and talk to us a few minutes asked nance we still have a quarter of an hour before bedtime otoyo timidly took a seat on a corner of one of the divans the girls could not help noticing another small package which she had not yet proffered for their acceptance but she now placed it in nance's hand a little of what american lady call meat sweet she said apologetically it all way from japan have coming will beautiful ladies accept so humbly gift the box contained candy ginger and was much appreciated by young american ladies the humble giver of this delightful confection being far too shy to eat any of it herself by dint of some questioning it came out that otoyo's father was a merchant of tokyo she had been sent to an american school in japan for two years and had also studied under an english governance she could read english perfectly and strange to say could write it fairly accurately but when it came to speaking it she clung to her early participial adverbial faults although she trusted to overcome them in a very little while she had several conditions to work off before thanksgiving but she was cheerful and her ambition was to be beautiful american young lady she was indeed the most charming little doll-like creature the girls had ever seen so unreal and different from themselves that they could hardly credit her with the feelings and sensibilities of a human being so correctly polite was she with such formal stiff little manners that she seemed almost an automaton wound up to bow and nod at the proper moment but otoyo sen was a creature of feeling as they were to find out before very long did many girls come down on the train with you tonight miss sen asked nance by way of making conversation several young ladies had come miss sen replied in her best participial manner all had been kind to otoyo but one who had frightened poor japanese very very much one very kind american gentleman had been commissioned to bring little japanese down from big city to university he had looked after her all day and brought her sandwiches he friend of her father and most most kindly he had receiving letters from her honorable father to look after little japanese girl across the aisle from otoyo had sat a big young american lady big as kindly young lady there with pink hair indicating molly the big young american lady it seems had great big eyes so otoyo made two circles with her thumbs and forefingers to indicate size of young american lady's optics she called otoyo yum yum and she made to laugh at humble japanese girl but otoyo could see that young american lady with big eyes feeling great anger toward little strange girl but for what reason asked molly slipping her arm around otoyo's plump waist how could she be unkind to sweet little japanese stranger young great-eyed lady laugh at me mostly and i very uncomfortably she brought out the big word with proud effort but how cruel why did she do it exclaimed nance here otoyo gave a delicious melodious laugh for the first time that evening she not like kindly gentlemanly friend to be attentionally to humble japanese what was the gentleman's name otoyo asked molly and somewhat to her surprise otoyo who as they were to learn later never forgot a name came out patly with professor edwin green kindly friend of honorable father did the young lady call him cousin asked nance in the tone of one who knows what the answer will be beforehand yes answered otoyo sen the same old judith blount laughed molly and nance recalled judy's prophetic speech on the last day of college in june can the leopard change his spots then the first stroke of the tower clock began to chime the hour of ten and they promptly conducted otoyo to her bedroom with the caution that all lights must be out at ten a rule she followed thereafter with implicit obedience the next morning molly and nance took otoyo under their especial care they introduced her to all the girls at queen's placed her between them at chapel showed her how to register and finally took her on a sight-seeing expedition it turned out that through professor green her room had been engaged since early the winter before why he should have chosen queen's they hardly knew since otoyo appeared to have plenty of money and might have lived in more expensive quarters but queens he had selected and that very evening he called on mrs markham to see that his little charge was comfortably settled 
molly caught a glimpse of him as he followed the maid through the hall to mrs markham's sitting-room and made him a polite bow she felt somewhat in awe of the professor of english literature this winter since she was to be in one of his classes lit too and was very fearful that he might consider her a perfect dunce but professor green would not pass molly with a bow he paused at the door of the living room and held out his hand i'm glad to see you back and looking so well he said my sister asked to be remembered to you i saw her only yesterday the professor looked well also his brown eyes were as clear as two brown pools in the forest and there was a healthy glow on his face but molly could not help noticing that he was growing bald about the temples too bad he's so old she thought because sometimes he's really handsome i am commissioned he continued to find a tutor for a young japanese girl boarding here and i wondered if you would like to undertake the work she needs lessons in english chiefly but she has several conditions to work off and it would be a steady position for anyone who has time to take it her father is a rich man and willing to pay more than the usual price if he can get someone specially interested who will take pains with his daughter's education i'm willing to do all that said molly but it goes with the job don't you think I have no right to ask more than is usually asked. Oh, yes, you have, answered the professor quickly. What you can give her means everything to the child. She is naturally very timid and strange. If you are willing to give up several hours to her, say four times a week, I will arrange about salary with her father and the lessons may begin immediately. It was impossible for Molly to disguise her feelings of relief and joy at this windfall. Her lack of funds was, as usual, an ever-present shadow in the background of her mind, although, through some fine investments which Mrs. Brown had been able to make that summer, the Brown family hoped to be relieved by another year of the pressure of poverty. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days » by Nell Speed this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson A Clashing of Wits Queen's Cottage seemed destined to shelter girls of interesting and unusual types. They always do flock together, you know, Miss Pomeroy had remarked to the President as the two women sat talking in the President's office one day. The question had come up with the subject of the new Japanese student, the first of her nation ever to seek learning in the halls of Wellington. They do, said the president, but whether it's the first comers actively persuading the next ones, or whether it's a matter of unconscious attraction is hard to tell. In this case, I understand it's a matter of very conscious attraction on one side and no persuasion on the other, replied Miss Pomeroy. That charming overgrown girl from Kentucky, Miss Brown, although she's as poor as a church mouse and last year even blacked boots to earn a little money, is one of the chief attractions, I think. But some of the other girls are quite remarkable. Margaret Wakefield lives there, you know. She makes as good a speech as her politician father. It will be interesting to watch her career if she only doesn't spoil everything by marrying. The two spinsters looked at each other and laughed she won't answered the president she's much too ambitious then went on miss pomeroy there's julia keene she could do almost anything she wished and like all such people she doesn't want to do anything she hasn't a spark of ambition it's miss brown who keeps her up to the mark the girl was actually about to run away last winter just at mid-years she lost her courage i believe and there was a remarkable scene but she was induced to stay who are the other girls asked the president thoughtfully one of them you recall is the daughter of the famous suffragette mrs anna oldham but i fancy the poor daughter has had quite enough of suffrage the only other really interesting characters at queen's besides your japanese are two sophomores who roomed at plimpton's last year they are the williams sisters catherine and edith and they are remarkably bright they work in a team, and I have not been able to discover which is the brighter of the two, although I had them to tea once or twice last year. One is talkative, and the other is quiet, but I suspect the quiet one of doing a deal of thinking. The two women enjoyed these occasional chats about Wellington students. 
they were accustomed to regard most of the classes as units rather than the members as individuals sometimes it was a colorless uninteresting class with no special traits worthy of admiration sometimes it was a snobbish purse-proud class as in the case of the present juniors and again as with last year's seniors it was a class of sterling qualities made up of big girls with fine minds seldom did a class contain more than one or two brilliant members often not one the present sophomore class was one of those freak bodies which appear once in a lifetime it was an unusually small class there being only thirty-eight members some twenty of these girls were extremely bright and at least ten gave promise of something more than ordinary as the fastest skaters keep together on the ice so the brightest girls gradually drifted into queens and became as one family it was known that there was a good deal of jealousy in the less distinguished portion of the class because of this sparkling group but all unconscious of the feeling they were exciting the queen's girls settled themselves down to the enjoyment of life each in her own peculiar way the two new sophomores at queen's were in fact a welcome addition and molly and her friends found them exceedingly amusing they were tall rather raw-boned types with sallow skins and large lustrous melancholy eyes there was only a year's difference in their ages and at first it was difficult to tell one from the other but edith the younger of the sisters was an inch taller than katherine and was very quiet while katherine talked enough for the two of them because they were always together they were called the gemini although occasionally they had terrific battles and ceased to be on speaking terms for a day or two one afternoon not long after the opening day at college the williams sisters and mabel hinton who now lived in the quadrangle paid a visit to molly in her room we came in to discuss with you who you consider would make the best class president this year molly began katherine it's rather hard to choose one among so many who could fill the place with distinction but i think margaret should be chosen interrupted molly she was a good one last year why change don't you think it looks rather like favoritism put in mabel some of the other girls should have a chance there's you for instance me cried molly why i wouldn't know how to act in a president's chair i'd be embarrassed to death you'd soon learn said katherine it's very easy to become accustomed to an exalted state but why not one of you began molly it's a question here remarked the silent edith whether a class president should be the most popular girl or the best executive margaret is both exclaimed molly loyally but after all why not leave it to the vote at the class meeting oh it will be finally decided in that way of course said katherine but such things are really decided beforehand by a little electioneering and i was proposing to do some stump speaking in your behalf molly if you care to take the place oh no cried molly flushing with embarrassment it's awfully nice of you but i wouldn't for anything interfere with margaret she is the one to have it besides as queen's girls we ought to vote for her she belongs to the family but some of the girls are kicking they say we are running the class and are sure to bring in one of our own crowd just to have things our way how absurd ejaculated molly i'm sure i never thought of such a thing but if that's the case why vote for me then because replied mabel the caroline brenton faction proposed you they say if they must have a queen's girl they'll take you must is a ridiculous word to use at an honest election broke in molly hotly let them choose their candidate and vote as they like we'll choose ours and vote as we like that's exactly the point said katherine they are something like kipling's monkey tribe the banderlog they do a lot of chattering but they can't come to any agreement they need a head and i propose to be that head and tell them whom to vote for shall it be molly or margaret margaret cried molly a thousand times margaret i wouldn't usurp her place for worlds she's perfectly equipped in every possible way for the position nance and judy now came into the room nance looked a little excited and judy was red in the face do you know burst out the impetuous judy that caroline brenton has called a mass meeting of all the sophomores not at queen's she has started up some cock-and-bull tale about the queen's girls trying to run the class she says we're a ring of politicians 
We ran in all our officers last year and we're going to try and do it this year. What a ridiculous notion, laughed Molly. Margaret was elected by her own silver-tongued oratory and Jessie was made secretary because she was so pretty and popular and seemed to belong next to Margaret anyway. But the question is, are the Queen's girls going to sit back and let themselves be libeled, demanded Nance. Here Edith spoke up. Of course, she said, let them talk. Don't you know that people who denounce weaken their own cause always, and it's the people who keep still who have all the strength on their side? Let them talk, and at the class meeting tomorrow, some of us might say a few quiet words to the point. The girls recognized the wisdom of this decision and concluded to keep well away from any forced meeting of sophomores that evening. It had not occurred to simple-hearted Molly that it was jealousy that had fanned the flame of indignation against Queen's girls, but it had occurred to some of the others, the Williamses in particular, who were very shrewd in regard to human nature. As for Margaret Wakefield, she was openly and shamelessly enjoying the fight. Let them talk, she said. Tomorrow we'll have some fun. Just because they have made such unjust accusations against us, they ought to be punished by being made to vote for us. It was noted that Margaret used the word us in speaking of future votes. She had been too well-bred to declare herself openly as candidate for the place of class president but it was generally known that she would not be displeased to become the successful candidate. The next morning they heard that only ten sophomores attended the mass meeting and that they had all talked at once. Later in the day when the class met to elect its president for the year, as Edith remarked, the hoi polloi did look black and threatening. Molly felt decidedly uncomfortable and out of it. She didn't know how to make a speech for one thing and she hoped they'd leave her alone. It was utterly untrue about Queen's girls. The cleverest girls in the class happened to live there. That was all. Margaret, the Williamses, and Judy wore what might be called pugilistic smiles. They intended to have a sweet revenge for the things that had been said about them, and on the whole they were enjoying themselves immensely. They had not taken Molly into their confidence, but what they intended to do was well planned beforehand. Former President Margaret occupied the chair and opened the meeting with a charming little speech that would have done credit to the wiliest politician. She moved her hearers by her reference to class feeling and their ambition to make the class the most notable that ever graduated from Wellington. She flattered and cajoled them and put them in such a good humor with themselves that there was wild applause when she finished and the Brenton forces sheepishly avoided each other's eyes. There was a long pause after this. Evidently, the opposing side did not feel capable of competing with so much oratory as that. Margaret rose again. Since no one seems to have anything to say, she said, I beg to start the election by nominating Miss Caroline Brenton of Philadelphia for our next class president. If a bombshell had burst in the room, there couldn't have been more surprise. Molly could have laughed aloud at the rebellious and fractious young woman from Philadelphia, who sat embarrassed and tongue-tied, unable to say a word. Again, there was a long pause. The Brenton forces appeared incapable of expressing themselves. I second the nomination of Miss Brenton, called Judy with a bland, innocent look in her gray eyes. Then Catherine Williams arose and delivered a deliciously humorous and delightful little speech that caused laughter to ripple all over the room. She ended by nominating Margaret Wakefield for re-election, and before they knew it, everybody in the room was applauding. Nominations for other officers were made after this, and a girl from Montana was heard to remark, I'm for Queens. They're a long sight brighter than any of us. When the candidates stood lined up on the platform just before the votes were cast, Caroline Brenton looked shriveled and dried up beside the ample proportions of Margaret Wakefield, who beamed handsomely on her classmates and smiled so charmingly that in comparison there appeared to be no two ways about it. She is the right one for president, Judy heard a girl say. She looks like a queen bee beside little Carrie Britton, and nobody could say she ran the election this time either. Carrie has had the chance she wanted. Molly was one of the nominees for secretary, and standing beside a nominee from the opposing side, she also shone in comparison. When the votes were counted, it was found that Margaret and Molly had each won by a large majority, and Caroline Brenton was ignominiously defeated. 
that night jessie lynch who had not in the least minded being superseded as secretary by molly gave a supper party in honor of her chum's re-election only queen's girls were there except mabel hinton and there was a good deal of fun at the expense of caroline brinton of philadelphia poor thing said molly i couldn't help feeling sorry for her but why demanded katherine she had the chance she wanted she was nominated but she was such a poor leader that her own forces wouldn't stand by her at the crucial moment oh but it was rich what a lesson and how charming margaret was how courteous and polite through it all what a beautiful way to treat an enemy what a beautiful way to treat wrath you mean said her sister with a soft answer it was as good as a play laughed judy i never enjoyed myself more in all my life but somehow molly felt a little uncomfortable always when she recalled that election although it was an honest straightforward election won by the force of oratory and personality and so skillfully that the opposing side never knew it had been duped by a prearranged plan of four extremely clever young women End of chapter three Chapter Four of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. A Tempest in a Teapot. Do you think those little feet of yours will be able to carry you so far, Otoyo? asked Molly anxiously one Saturday morning. Otoyo gave one of her delightfully ingenuous smiles. My body is smally too, she said the weight is not grandly not smally just small otoyo admonished molly who was now well launched in her tutoring of the little japanese and had almost broken her of her participial habits but the adverbial habit appeared to grow as the participial habit vanished and you won't get too tired asked judy no 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 protested otoyo her voice rising with each note until it ended in a sweet high note like a bird's you not know the Japanese when you say that. I have received training. You have heard of jujitsu? Some day Otoyo will teach beautiful young American ladies some things. Yes, but the jujitsu doesn't help you when you're tired, does it? Ah, but I shall not be tired. You will see. Otoyo speak great bigly. She stuck out her funny, stubby little feet for inspection, and the girls all laughed. As a matter of fact, she was a sturdy little body and knew the secret of keeping her strength. She achieved marvels in her studies, was up with the dawn and the last person in the house to tumble into bed, but she was never tired, never cross and out of humor, and was always a model of cheerful politeness. Art ready? asked Catherine Williams, appearing at the door in a natty brown corduroy walking suit. Canst have the face to ask the question when we've been waiting for you ten minutes, replied Judy it was a glorious september day when the walking club from queens started on its first expedition the rules of the club were few very elastic and susceptible to changes it met when it could walked until it was tired and had no fixed object except that of resting the eyes from the printed page relaxing the mind from its arduous labors and accelerating the circulation any one who wanted to invite a guest could and those who wished to remain at home were not bound to go did anybody decide where we were going asked molly yes i did announced margaret knob ledge is our destination it's the highest point in wellington county and commands a most wonderful view of the surrounding countryside dear me you sound like a guidebook margaret put in judy professor green is the guidebook answered margaret he told me about it you know he is the only real walker at wellington Twenty miles is nothing to him, and Knob Ledge is one of his favorite trips. I hope that isn't twenty miles, said Jessie anxiously. Oh, no, it's barely six by the short way and ten by the road. We shall go by the short way. Isn't Molly lovely today? whispered Nance to Judy after the walking expedition had crossed the campus and started on its way in good earnest. Molly was a picture in an old gray skirt and a long sweater and tam of Wellington blue knitted by one of her devoted sisters during the summer. She's a dream, exclaimed Judy with loyal enthusiasm. She glorifies everything she wears. 
just an ordinary blue tam o shanter exactly the same shape and color that a hundred other wellington girls wear looks like a halo on a saint's head when she wears it it's her auburn hair that's the halo said nance and her heavenly blue eyes that are saint's eyes finished judy molly all unconscious of the admiration of her friends walked steadily along between otoyo and jesse a package of sandwiches in one hand and a long staff picked up on the road in the other they were not exactly out for her adventure that day being simply a jolly party of girls off in the woods to enjoy the last sunny days in september and they were not prepared for all the excitements which greeted them on the way scarcely had they left the path along the bank of the lake and skirted the foot of round head at the top of which molly and her two chums had once met professor green and his brother when margaret wakefield well in advance of the others gave a wild scream and rushed madly back into their midst trotting sedately after her came an amiable-looking cow the creature paused when she saw the girls emitted the bovine call of the cow mother separated from her only child turned and trotted slowly back why margaret i didn't know you were such a coward began jessie reproachfully coward indeed answered the other indignantly i don't believe queen boudicca herself in a red sweater would have passed that animal listen to the creature she's begun mooing like a foghorn i suppose she held me personally responsible for her loss anyhow she began chasing me and i wasn't going to be gored to death in the flower of my youth there was no arguing this fact and several daring spirits creeping along the path until it curved around the hill hid behind a clump of trees and took in the prospect there stood the cow with ears erect and quivering nostrils she had a suspicious look in her lustrous eyes and at intervals she let out a deep bellow that had a hint of disaster in it for all who passed that way the brave spirits went back again what are we to do exclaimed Catherine if it got out in college that an old cow kept ten sophomores from having a picnic we'd never hear the last of it unless we behave like indian scouts and creep along one at a time i don't see what we are to do said molly if we went further up the hill she'd see us just the same and if we crossed the brook and took to the meadow we'd get stuck in the swamp suppose we make a run for it suggested judy with high courage just dash past until we reach that group of trees over there not me exclaimed jessie shaking her head vigorously excuse me if you please there was another conference in low voices behind the protecting clump of alder bushes at last the cow began to ease her mental suffering by nibbling at the damp green turf on the bank of the little brook she's forgotten all about us let's make a break for it cried molly there was a certain stubbornness in her nature that made her want to finish anything she began no matter whether it was a task or a pleasure the cow flicked a fly from her flank with her tail and went on placidly cropping grass apparently creature comforts had restored her equanimity one two three run shouted judy and the ten students began the race of their lives not once did the flower and wood of nineteen aught pause to look back and so closely did they stick together the strong helping the weak that to the watchers on the hill and alas there were several of them they resembled altogether an enormous animal of the imagination with ten pairs of legs and a coat of many colors at last they fell down one on top of the other in a laughing tumbling heap in the protecting grove of pine trees and pausing to look back beheld the ferocious cow amiably swishing her tail as she cropped the luscious turf on the bank of the little stream asinine old thing cried margaret she's just an alarmist of the worst kind who was the alarmist did you say margaret asked edith with a wicked smile but margaret made no answer because as her close friends well knew she never could stand being teased and now the watchers on the hill having witnessed the entire episode from behind a granite boulder and enjoyed it to the limit of their natures proceeded to return to wellington with the story that was too good to keep and queen's girls went on their way rejoicing as the strong man who runs a race and wins at two o'clock after a long hard climb they reached the ledges to molly and judy the leading spirits of the expedition the beautiful view amply repaid their efforts but there were those who were too weary to enjoy the scenery jessie was one of these i'm not meant for hard work she groaned as she reposed on one of the flat rocks which gave the place its name and pillowed her head on margaret's lap they opened the packages of luncheon and ate with ravenous appetites 
finishing off with fudge and cheese sticks then they spread themselves on the table rocks and regarded the scenery pensively having climbed up at great expense of strength and effort it was now necessary to retrace their footsteps the thought was disconcerting edith who never moved without a book pulled a small edition of keats from her pocket and began to read aloud my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock i had drunk a short laugh interrupted this scene of intellectual repose edith paused and looked up annoyed i see nothing to laugh at she said but the faces of her classmates were quite serious no one laughed said molly a rudely person did laugh announced otoyo decisively but not of us another hidden behind the rock the girls looked around them uneasily there was no one in sight apparently and yet there had been a laugh from somewhere close by coming to think of it they had all heard it i think we'd better be going said margaret rising hastily we can see the view on the other side some other day twice that day margaret the coming suffragette had proved herself lacking in a certain courage generally attributed to the new and independent woman come on she continued irritably don't stop to gather up those sandwiches we must hurry perhaps they were all of them a little frightened but nobody was quite so openly and shamelessly scared as president wakefield they had seized their sweaters and were about to follow her down the steep path when another laugh was heard and suddenly a strange man rushed from behind one of the large boulders and seized margaret by the arm the president gave one long despairing shriek that waked the echoes while the other girls too frightened to move crouched together in a trembling group then the little japanese bounded from their midst with the most surprising agility seized the man by his thumb and with a lightning movement of the arm struck him under the chin with a cry of intense pain the tramp for such he appeared to be fell back against the rock his black slouch hat fell off and a quantity of dark hair tumbled down on his shoulders judith blount looking exceedingly ludicrous in a heavy black mustache stood before them oh how you hurt me she cried turning angrily on otoyo otoyo shrank back in amazement pardon she said timidly i did not know the rudely man was a woman the girls were now treated to the rare spectacle of margaret wakefield in a rage the goddess of war herself could not have been more majestic in her anger and her choice of words was wonderful as she emptied the vials of her wrath on the head of the luckless judith the williams sisters sat down on a rock prepared to enjoy the splendid exhibition and the discomfiture of judith blount who for once had gone too far in her practical joking molly withdrew somewhat from the scene anger always frightened her but she felt that margaret was quite justified in what she said how dare you masquerade in those disreputable clothes and frighten us margaret thundered out do you think such behavior will be tolerated for a moment at a college of the standing of wellington university are you aware that some of us might have been seriously injured by what you would call i suppose a practical joke is this your idea of amusement it is not mine do you get any enjoyment from such a farce at last margaret paused for breath but for once judith had nothing to say she hung her head shamefacedly and the girls who were with her whoever they were hung back as if they would fain have their share in the affair kept secret i'm sorry said judith with unusual humility i didn't realize it was going to frighten you so much you see i don't look much like a man in my gymnasium suit of course the mackintosh and hat did look rather realistic i'll admit when we saw you run from the cow this morning it was so perfectly ludicrous we decided to have some fun i put on these togs and we got a vehicle and drove around by the exmoor road i'm sorry if you were scared but i think i came out the worst my thumb is sprained and i know my neck will be black and blue by tomorrow i advise you to give up playing practical jokes hereafter said the unrelenting goddess of war if your thumb is sprained it's your own fault judith flashed a black glance at her when i lower myself to make you an apology she ejaculated i should think you'd have the courtesy to accept it and with that she walked swiftly around the edge of the rock where she joined her confederates while the queen's girls demurely took their way down the side of the hill was my deed wrongly then asked otoyo innocently feeling somehow that she had been the cause of the great outburst no indeed child your deed was rightly laughed margaret 
and I'm going to take jujitsu lessons from you right away. If I could twirl a robber around the thumb like that and hit a cow under her chin, I don't think I'd be such a coward. Everybody burst out laughing, and Molly felt greatly relieved that Harmony was once more established. The walk ended happily, and by the time they had reached home, Judith Blount had been relegated to an unimportant place in their minds. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. An unwilling eavesdropper. Busy days followed for Molly. She had been made chairman of the Committee on Decoration for the sophomore freshman reception, along with all her many other duties, and had entered into it as conscientiously as she went into everything. Some days before the semi-official party for the gathering of autumn foliage and evergreens, Chairman Molly and Judy had a consultation. What we want is something different, Judy remarked, and Molly smiled, remembering that her friend's greatest fear in life was to appear commonplace. Caroline Brenton will want cheesecloth, of course, said Molly, but I think she'll be outvoted if we can only talk to the committee beforehand. My plan is to mass all the greens around the pillars and hang strings of Japanese lanterns between the galleries. And, went on fanciful Judy, who adored decoration, let's make a big primrose and violet banner exactly the same size as the Wellington banner and hang them from the center of the gymnasium, one on each side of the chandelier. A meeting of the class was called to consider the question of the banner, and it was decided not only to have the largest class banner ever seen at Wellington, but to give the entire class a hand in the making of it. The money was to be raised partly by subscription and partly by an entertainment to be given later. The girls were very proud of the gorgeous pennant when it was completed. Every sophomore had lent a helping hand in its construction, which had taken several hours a day for the better part of a week. It was of silk, one side lavender and the other side primrose color. On the lavender side, Wellington in yellow silk letters had been briar stitched on by two skillful sophomores and on the primrose side was 19 aught in lavender. The Wellington banner, a gift from the alumnae, was also of silk in the soft blue which every Wellington girl loved. It was necessary to obtain a special permission from President Walker to use this flag, which was brought out only on state occasions and it devolved on Molly as chairman to make the formal request for her class. That this intrepid class of sophomores was the first ever to ask to use the banner had not occurred to her when she knocked at the door of the president's office. Miss Walker would see her in ten minutes, she was told by Miss Maxwell, the president's secretary, and she sat down in the long drawing room to await her summons. It was a pleasant place in which to linger, Molly thought, as she leaned back in a beautiful old armchair of the 16th century, which had come from a Florentine palace. Most of the furniture and ornaments in the room had been brought over from Italy by Miss Walker at various times. There were mirrors and high-backed carved chairs from Venice. Over the mantel was a beautiful frieze of singing children, and at one side was a photograph, larger even than Mary Stewart's of the Primavera. On the other side of the mantel was a lovely round Madonna, which Molly thought also might be a Botticelli. As her eyes wandered from one object to another in the charming room, her tense nerves began to relax. At last, her gaze rested on the photograph of a pretty, dark-haired girl in an old-fashioned black dress. There was something very appealing about the sweet face looking out from the carved gilt frame, a certain peaceful calmness in her expression and peace had not been infused into Molly's daily life lately. What a rush things had been in, every moment of the day occupied. There were times when it was so overwhelming, this college life, that she felt she could not breast the great wave of duties and pleasures that surged about her. And now at last, in the subdued soft light of President Walker's drawing room, she found herself alone and in delightful, perfect stillness. How polished the floors were! They were like dim mirrors in which the soft colors of old hangings were reflected. Two Venetian glass vases on the mantel gave out an opalescent gleam in the twilight. Some day I shall have a room like this, Molly thought, closing her eyes. I shall wear peacock blue and old rose dresses like the Florentine ladies and do my hair in a gold net. Her heavy eyelids fluttered and drooped. 
her hand slipped from the arms of her chair into her lap and her breathing came regularly and even like a child's she was sound asleep and while she slept miss maxwell peeped into the room seeing no one apparently in the dim light she went out again evidently the sophomore had not waited she decided so she said nothing to miss walker about it half an hour slipped noiselessly by the sun set for a few minutes the western window reflected a deep crimson light then the shadows deepened and the room was almost dark never mind the lights mary i'll see miss walker in her office at five thirty said a voice at the door she expects me and i'll wait here until it's time very well sir answered the maid someone came softly into the room and sat down near the window well removed from the sleeping molly again the stillness was unbroken and the young girl sitting in the antique chair in which noble lords and ladies and perhaps cardinals and archbishops had sat began to dream she thought the dark-haired girl in the photograph was standing beside her she wore a long straight black dress that seemed to fade off into the shadows molly remembered the face perfectly there was a sorrowful look on it now then suddenly the sadness changed inexplicably and the face was the face in the photograph the peaceful calmness returned and the eyes looked straight into molly's as they did from the picture molly started slightly and opened her eyes i must have been asleep she thought my dear edwin miss walker's voice was saying this is terrible i am so shocked and sorry what's to be done i don't know i haven't been able to think yet it was all so sudden i had just heard when i telephoned you half an hour ago it's a great blow to the family grace is with them now and she's a tower of strength you know what's to be done about judith she was getting on so well this year i think her punishment last winter did her good she did appear to be in a better frame of mind said professor green dryly is she to be told at once she has to be told about the money of course but the disgraceful part is to be kept from her as much as possible molly's heart began to beat what should she do make her presence known to professor green and miss walker but how very embarrassing that would be to break suddenly into this intimate conversation and confess that she had overheard a family secret the thing has been kept quiet so far went on the professor the newspapers strange to say have not got hold of it but it's going to take every cent the family can get together to pull out of the hole hardly half a dozen persons outside the family know the real state of the case i have taken you into my confidence because you are an old and intimate friend of the family and because we must reach some decision about judith her mother wants her to stay right where she is now just as if nothing had happened judith has always been very proud and her mother thinks it would be too much of a come down for her to live in cheaper quarters nonsense exclaimed miss walker on the contrary i think it would do judith good to associate with girls who are not so well off put her with a group of clever hard-working girls like the ones at queen's for instance molly's heart gave a leap how much she would like to tell the girls this compliment the president had paid them then again the embarrassment of her position overwhelmed her she was about to force herself to rise and confess that she had been an unwitting eavesdropper when she heard the professor's voice from the door saying well you advise me to do nothing this evening richard is going to call me up again in an hour on the long distance in the village for the sake of privacy if he agrees with you i'll wait until tomorrow where's mr blount now they think he's on his way to south america you see richard in some way found out about the fake mining deal and the family is trying to get together enough money to pay back the stockholders there are not many local people involved most of it was sold in the west and south and we hope to refund all the money in the course of time it's nearly half a million you know and while the blounts have a good deal of real estate it takes time to raise money on it what did you say the name of the mine was i have heard but it has slipped my memory the square deal mine a bad name considering it was about the crookedest deal ever perpetrated molly started so violently that the venetian vases on the mantel quivered and the little table on which stood the picture in the gilt frame trembled like an aspen the square deal mine had she heard anything else but that name all summer had not her mother on the advice of an old friend invested every cent she could rake and scrape together except the fund for her own college expenses in that very mine and everybody in the neighborhood had done the same thing it's a sure thing mrs brown colonel gray had told her mother i'm going to put in all i have because an old friend at the head of one of the oldest and most reliable firms in the country is backing it 
the voices grew muffled as the president and professor green moved slowly down the hall molly felt ill and tired would the blounts be able to pay back the money suppose they were not and she had to leave college while judith was to be allowed to finish her education and live in the most expensive rooms in wellington she pressed her lips together such thoughts were unworthy of her and she tried to brush them out of her mind poor judith she said to herself the president's footsteps sounded on the stairs she paused on the landing cleared her throat and mounted the second flight how dark it had grown a feeling of sickening fear came over molly and suddenly she rushed blindly into the hall and out of the house without once looking behind her down the steps she flew and in her headlong flight collided with professor green who had evidently started to go in one direction and changing his mind turned to go toward the village why miss brown has anything frightened you you are trembling like a leaf i i was only hurrying she replied lamely have you been to see the president i didn't see her it was too late answered molly evasively they walked on in silence for a moment i am going down to the village for a long distance message may i see you to your door on my way he asked oh yes said molly half inclined to confide to the professor that she had just overheard his conversation but a kind of shyness closed her lips they began talking of other things chiefly of the little japanese molly's pupil at the door of queen's the professor took her hand and looked down at her kindly you were frightened at something he said smiling gravely confess now were you not there was nothing to frighten me she answered did you ever see a picture she continued irrelevantly a photograph in a gilt frame on a little table in the president's drawing-room it's a picture of a slender girl in an old-fashioned black dress her hair is dark and her face is rather pale-looking oh yes that's a photograph of miss elaine walker president walker's sister where is she now asked molly she died in that house some twenty-five years ago you know miss walker succeeded her father as president and they have always lived there miss elaine was in her senior year when she had typhoid fever and died it was a good deal of a blow i believe to the family and to the entire university she was very popular and very talented she wrote charming poetry i have read some of it no doubt she would have done great things if she had lived after all molly argued with herself i went to sleep looking at her photograph it was the most natural thing in the world to dream about it but why did she look so sorrowful and then so hopeful i can't forget her face once again she was on the point of speaking to professor green about the mine and once again she checked her confidence the cautious nance had often said to her if there's any doubt about mentioning a thing i never mention it by the way miss brown i wonder if there are any vacant rooms here at queen's yes said molly there happens to be a singleton it was to have been taken by a junior who broke her arm or something and couldn't come back to college this year why have you any more little japs for me to tutor no but i was thinking there might have to be some changes a little later and miss blount my cousin would perhaps be looking for uh, less commodious quarters but don't mention it please it may not be necessary i may have to make some changes myself for the same reason thought poor molly but she said nothing except a trembly shaky good night which made the professor look into her face closely and then stand watching her as she hastened up the steps and was absorbed by the shadowy interior of queen's still unlighted hallway end of chapter five chapter six of molly brown's sophomore days by nell speed this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by debbie r baker robinson two long distance calls the president readily granted her gracious permission for the sophomores to use the wellington alumni banner she was pleased at the class spirit which had engendered the request and which had also prompted the sophomores to make a banner of their own with reverent hands the young girls hoisted the two splendid pennants on the evening of the reception and another unusual distinction was granted this extraordinary class of nineteen aught the president and several of the faculty appeared that evening in the gallery to view the effect never before in the memory of students had prexy attended a sophomore freshman ball they have certainly made the place attractive said the president 
looking down between the interstices of garlands of japanese lanterns on the scene of whirling dancers below the banners are really beautiful i feel quite proud of my sophomores this evening the sophomores were proud of themselves and worked hard to make the freshmen have a good time and feel at home molly remembering her own timidity of the year before took care that there were no wallflowers this gala evening she had invited madeline petite a lonely little southern girl who had a room over the post office in the village and was working her way through college somehow in spite of her own depleted purse molly had sent madeline a bunch of violets and had hired a carriage for the evening as for the little freshman she was ecstatic with pleasure she never dreamed that her sophomore escort was nearly as poor as she was people of molly's type never look poor the richness of her coloring her red-gold hair and deep blue eyes and a certain graciousness of manner overcame all deficiencies in the style and material of her lavender organdy frock but in spite of her glowing cheeks and outward gaiety molly was far from being happy that night no word had come to her from her family all the week although they were the most prolific letter writers all of them no doubt they hesitated for a while to let her know the truth about the square deal mine molly was prepared for anything prepared to give up college at mid-years and get a position to teach school in the country somewhere prepared to look the worst in the face bravely but wellington was like a second home to her now she loved its twin gray towers its classic quadrangle and beautiful cloisters its spacious campus shaded with elm trees how dear these things had grown to her now that the thought of leaving them forced its way into her mind she was debating these questions inwardly as she gallantly led her partner over to the lemonade table where mary stewart in a beautiful liberty dress of pigeon blue that matched her eyes was presiding with judith blount and two other juniors why molly brown exclaimed mary in spite of all your glowingness you don't seem quite like yourself this evening has anything happened to roughen your gentle disposition no bad news from home i hope oh no returned molly no news at all i haven't heard all week judith who still had a grudge against queen's girls although she was endeavoring to overcome it here remarked why i think you're looking particularly well tonight, molly such a becoming dress molly flushed as she glanced hastily down at her two-year-old organdy mary stewart put a hand over her cold slim fingers you always wear becoming dresses molly dear in fact they are so becoming that no one ever looks at the dress for looking at you molly smiled and pressed her friend's hand in return she was wondering if judith blount would learn to curb her tongue when she had to curb her expenses i want you to meet miss petite she said introducing the little freshman to the two older girls mary stewart shook hands kindly and judith bowed distantly certainly judith was in a bad humor that night how do you like wellington asked mary of miss petite by way of making conversation i think it's just lovely drawled the little southerner with her inimitable louisiana accent i never danced on a better floor before in all my life mary stewart smiled the soft melodious voice was music to her ears you live in the quadrangle don't you i think i saw you there the other day continued mary oh no i reckon you saw some other girl i live over the post office in the village she has a charming room broke in molly when she was interrupted by a stifled laugh looking up quickly they were confronted with judith and one of her boon companions their faces crimson with suppressed laughter miss petite regarded the two juniors with a kind of gentle amazement then without the slightest embarrassment she said to mary and molly what lovely manners some of the wellington girls have at this uncomfortable juncture edith williams sailed up this is my dance isn't it mademoiselle petite and while we dance i want you to talk all the time so that my ears can drink in your liquid tones have you heard her speak miss stewart isn't it beautiful it's like the call of the wood pigeons so soft and persuasive and delicious now you're flattering me said little miss petite but i'm glad it doesn't make you laugh anyhow and she floated off in the arms of the tall edith as gracefully as a fluffy little cloud carried along by the breezes isn't she sweet said molly presently and you can't imagine what she is doing to make both ends meet here she won a scholarship which pays her tuition but she has to earn the money for board and clothes and all the rest 
she washes dishes at a boarding house for her dinners and cooks her own breakfasts in her room and eats well any old thing for her lunch on her door is a sign that says darning copying pressing and fine laundry work shampooing and manicuring it makes me feel awfully ashamed of my small efforts is it possible exclaimed mary how can i help her molly without her knowing it she seems to be a proud little thing oh i don't know give her some jabots to do up or have your hair shampooed she does hand painting on china too but i don't think you could quite go her pink rose designs she'll outgrow hand-painted china in another year just as i outgrew framed lithographs and antimacassars in one evening after seeing your rooms in the quadrangle by the way molly have you invited anyone for the glee club concert yet no because i didn't know anyone well enough to ask except lawrence upton from exmoor and judith has already asked him good said mary then will you do me a favor brother willie is coming down to the concert and expects to bring two friends will you take one of them under your wing molly was only too delighted to be of service to the friend who had done so much for her it will be a pleasure and a joy she said as she hastened away to find her small partner for the next waltz the jokes and croaks stage of the sophomore freshman reception had been reached and katherine williams speaking through the megaphone was saying an art contribution from the juniors with accompanying verse i never saw a purple cow and never hoped to see one but this i know i vow i trow i'd rather see than be one while katherine read the verse another girl held up a large picture entitled the flight of the royal family in the foreground was a little purple cow grazing on purple turf and in the background running at full speed with every indication of extreme terror on their faces were a dozen queens wearing gold crowns and lavender and primrose robes hardly a girl at wellington but had heard of the absurd adventure of the queen's girls and a tremendous laugh shook the walls of the gymnasium in the midst of this uproar someone touched molly on the shoulder it was a junior known to her only by sight who whispered you're wanted on the telephone now all telegrams to wellington college were received at the telegraph office in the village and telephoned over and when molly was notified that there was a message for her she felt instinctively that it was a telegram from home and they would only telegraph bad news she was certain her face was pale and her heart thumping as she hurried out of the gymnasium nance and judy rose and followed her if anything was the matter with their beloved friend they were determined to share her trouble molly hastened to the telephone booths in the main corridor is it a telegram she asked the young woman in charge of the switchboard for in the last few years telephones had been installed in all the houses of the faculty and their respective offices as well thereby saving many steps and much time hello long distance called the girl without answering molly's question here's your party booth number two she ordered the operator had very little patience with college girls and this atomless eden palled on her city-bred soul hello said molly then came a small thin voice an immense distance away but strangely familiar is this miss molly brown of kentucky yes who is this this is richard blount have you forgotten me of course not is your mother mrs mildred carmichael brown of carmichael station kentucky yes um i suppose you think it's very strange miss brown my asking you this question called the thin faraway voice i had a very good reason for asking it have you heard from home lately not for a week is anything the matter with my family besides the no no nothing that i know of is it about the mine yes but you are not to worry you understand you are not to worry one instant everything will come out all right it was nearly ten thousand dollars said molly almost sobbing our house and garden and the rest of the apple orchard that was sending me to college here she broke down completely i may have to give up all this i may now miss molly you mustn't cry you make me feel like the very very unhappy way off here five minutes up called the voice of the exchange good-bye good-bye called molly i'm sorry i cried mr blount poor man it was all terribly hard on him and it was cruel of her to have given way but it had come so unawares from a corner of her eye she could see her friends waiting anxiously outside the booth 
she pretended to be writing something on the telephone pad with a stubby pencil tied to a string until she recovered her composure what's the matter demanded the two girls as she emerged from the booth it was just a long distance from richard blount said molly not knowing what else to say i didn't know you had asked him to go to the glee club concert said nance he can't go molly replied quickly relieved that they had been willing to accept this explanation i should think he couldn't put in judy in a low voice mamma has just written me such news about the blounts the letter came by the late mail and i didn't have a chance to read it until a little while ago mr blount has failed and gone away no one knows where they thought they could pay off his creditors and his family found that he had mortgaged all his property and there wasn't any money left in the dimly lighted corridor the girls had not noticed that molly had turned perfectly white and was clasping and unclasping her hands convulsively in an effort to retain her self-control no money left she repeated in a low voice not a cent said judy papa knows because he had some friends who lost money in a mine or something mr blount owned poor judith observed nance do you suppose she hasn't been told of course not she wouldn't be flaunting around here tonight if she knew her family were in trouble how strange for us to know and for her not to pursued nance it isn't generally known mamma says the papers haven't got hold of it yet and i'm not to tell you see mamma and i met judith blount one afternoon at a matinee just before college opened that's why she was interested because she remembered that judith was mr blount's daughter all this time molly's mind was busy working out the problem of how to remain at college without any money of course the blounts couldn't pay their father's debts on nothing although richard blount had told her not to worry the family would have to move out of their old home she supposed and take a small house in town and everybody would have to just turn in and go to work oh why had her mother heeded the advice of old colonel gray he had assured her that she would make at least fifteen thousand from the money invested while he poor man had squandered his entire inheritance in the enterprise just because an old and intimate friend was backing it that old and intimate friend was mr blount and molly had never guessed it pretty soon it was time to go home molly found herself in the carriage trying to listen politely to the ceaseless flow of miss petite's conversation while she wrapped her old gray eiderdown cape about her and thought and thought suddenly the words of madeline petite pierced her troubled mind do you write miss brown i wish i could i'd like to try for some of the prizes for short stories think of winning a thousand dollars for one story wouldn't it be glorious then there are some advertisement prizes too one for five hundred dollars think of that i always cut out every one i see meaning to compete but i never do it isn't in my line you see i'm going to major in mathematics molly smiled that the dainty little creature should have chosen that hated subject for her life's work you say you saved the clippings about prizes she asked when they had reached madeline's lodging oh yes i have them all in my room would you like to see some of them tell the man to wait and i'll bring them down molly reached queen's that night before the other girls and hastening to the student's lamp she proceeded to look over the clippings one was from a leading women's magazine one from a magazine of short stories several from advertising firms the best jingle about a stove polish the best catchy phrase about a laundry soap the best advertisement in verse or prose for a real estate company which had purchased an entire mountain and was engaged in erecting numbers of swiss chalets for summer residents the pictures of these pretty little houses were very attractive many of them had poetical names one of them called the chalet of the west wind occupied the center of the page from its broad gallery could be seen a long vista of valley flanked by mountain ranges what a charming place thought molly and that night she went to bed with the chalet of the west wind so deeply photographed in her mind that she almost felt as if she had been there herself she could see it perched on the side of the mountain looking across the valley it was at the very edge of the forest the picture showed that, and in her imagination she scented the wild flowers that must grow at its feet in the springtime. No doubt the west wind, which symbolized health and happiness, fair weather and sunshine, blew softly through its open casements and across its spacious galleries. She went to sleep dreaming of the chalet of the west wind, and in the morning something throbbed in her pulses. 
It was a kind of muffled pounding at first, like the beginning of a long-distance call. Lumpity-tum-tum, lumpity-tum-tum. But gradually a poem took shape in her mind, and as the fragments came to her, she wrote them down on scraps of paper and hid them carefully in her desk. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Glee Club Concert. If a cross section could be made of this house, it would be rather amusing, exclaimed Judy Keene. In every room there would be one girl buttoning up another girl. It was the evening of the Glee Club concert, and nearly everybody not a freshman was going to dine somewhere before the concert. Judy and Nance were invited to the McLean's, and Molly was to have dinner with Mary Stewart and her guests in the quadrangle apartment. During the process of dressing, there was a great deal of crosstalk going on at Queen's that night. Through the open doors along the corridors, voices could be heard calling, Has anyone a piece of narrow black velvet? Margaret, don't you dare go without hooking me up. Who thinks white shoes and stockings are too dressy? Oh, my, but you look scrumptious. Molly had saved her most prized dress for this occasion. It was the one she had purchased the Christmas before in New York and was made of old blue chiffon cloth over a slimsy satin lining with two big old rose velvet poppies at the belt. It was cut out in the neck and the sleeves were short. Just before coming back to college, she had indulged in long, acre suede gloves, which she now drew on silently. She had received a letter from her mother that morning, and her heart was heavy within her. The letter said, The investment I made last summer has not turned out well. The young son has assured me that the family intends to pay back all the creditors, and I am trying not to worry. In the meantime, my precious daughter, you must not think of giving up college as you offered in your last letter, that is, until this term is over. Then we will see what can be done, although I am obliged to tell you that things do not look very hopeful about any present funds. Jane is to take a position in town as librarian, and Minnie intends to start a dancing class. Your brothers and sisters and I will get on, but, oh, I did so want you to have the advantages of a good education." But so much else goes with the education, Molly protested to herself. So many pleasures and enjoyments. Somehow, it doesn't seem fair for me to be going to glee club concerts when all my family are working so hard. Have you any stamps, Judy? She asked suddenly as she hooked that young woman into her dress. As many as you want, up to a dozen, answered Judy. They are in the pillbox on my desk. Molly made her way through Judy's tumbled apartment and helped herself to the stamps. I'll return them tomorrow, she said absently, drawing a letter from her portfolio, slipping one stamp into the envelope and sticking the other on the back. What in the world are you writing to a real estate firm for, Molly? demanded Judy, looking over Molly's shoulder. Oh, just answering an ad. Are you so rich that you are going to buy a farm? I wish I were. Judy's curiosity never gave her any peace, and she now desired earnestly to know why Molly was corresponding with this strange firm. If it turns out well, I'll tell you, said Molly, but if it doesn't, you'll never, never know. You mean thing, and I thought you loved me, ejaculated Judy. I do, that's why I won't tell you. If I did, I would have to inflict something worse on you, and you wouldn't be so thankful for that part. I shall burst if I don't know, cried Judy in despair. Burst into a million little pieces then, like the Snow Queen's looking glass, and get into people's eyes and make them see queer Judy pictures and think queer Judy thoughts. Meanie, meanie, called Judy after her friend, who had seized her gray eiderdown cape and was fleeing down the hall. I love all this, thought Molly, as she hastened up the campus to the quadrangle. I adore the gay talk and the jokes. Oh, heavens, but it will be hard to leave it. I understand now how Mary Stewart felt when she almost decided not to come back this year and then gave up and came after all. Molly felt she would enjoy the sensation of being waited on at a table that night instead of waiting herself, as she had done about this time last year at Judith Blount's dinner. She wondered if there would be a poor little trembly freshman to pass the food. But Mary was too kind-hearted for such things and had engaged two women in the village to cook and serve her dinner. 
the other guests had not arrived when molly let herself into the beautiful living room of the apartment which was now turned into a dining room the drop-leaf mahogany table had been drawn into the middle of the floor and was set with dazzling linen and silver for eight persons i wonder who the other two are thought molly is that you molly dear called mary from the bedroom well come and hook my dress how many yards of hooks and eyes had molly joined together that evening and here's something for you willie when he found out you were taking him sent you some violets heavens cried the young girl after she had finished mary and opened the large purple box oh mary this bunch is big enough for three people it's only intended for one and that's you laughed the other the bouquet was indeed as large as a soup plate i don't think i'd better wear them to dinner i couldn't see over them i should feel as if i were carrying a violet bed on my chest and so you are no doubt it took all the violets from one large double bed for that bunch but you had better wear them at first and take them off at the table brother willie is one of the touchiest young persons imaginable father and i have always called him the sensitive plant hastily molly pinned on the enormous bunch which covered the entire front of her dress they are coming now she said hearing steps in the next room and peeping through the door she beheld brother willie himself resplendent in his evening clothes in company with two other equally resplendent beings all wearing white gardenias in their buttonholes my goodness they look like a wedding molly whispered to her friend aren't they grand laughed mary and here i am as plain as an old shoe and never will be anything else you are the finest thing i know exclaimed molly tucking her arm through her friends and allowing herself to be led rather timidly into the living room the third girl at this fine affair was another post-grad and presently molly rejoiced to see miss grace green enter with her brother edwin miss green looked very pretty and young she kissed molly and told her she was a dear and smelt the violets and pinched her cheek glancing slyly at the three young men any one of whom might have burdened her with that huge bouquet and did not such bouquets argue something more than ordinary friendship as for the professor he glanced at the bouquet almost before he looked at molly then he shook her stiffly by the hand and turning away devoted himself to the postgrad do they know that my mother has lost all her money in their cousin's mine molly thought perhaps that's the reason why professor green is so cold tonight he's embarrassed at dinner molly sat between will stewart and an elegant rich young man named raymond belair who talked in rather a drawling voice about yachting parties and cross-country riding and motoring at college you know the fellows are awfully set on those little two-seated electric affairs what car did molly prefer molly was obliged to admit that she preferred the stewart car in new york whatever that was it being the only one she had ever written in the young man screwed a monocle into one eye and looked at her he was half english and had half a right to a monocle but molly wished he wouldn't screw up his eye like that it made her want to laugh however he didn't appear to notice at all that she was endeavoring to keep the irresistible laugh curve from her lips he only looked at her harder and then remarked i say by jove you'd make a jolly fine portia did you ever think of going on the stage oh no i'm going to be a schoolteacher answered molly schoolteacher he repeated aghast you with that hair and by jove those violets his eyes had lighted on the mammoth bunch tell that to the marines molly flushed the violets haven't anything to do with my teaching school she said a little indignantly and neither has my hair didn't you ever see a red-headed schoolteacher not when her hair curled like that and had glints of gold in it you're teasing me because i'm only a sophomore she said and turned her head away no by jove i'm not though protested raymond belair looking much pained but molly was talking to willie stewart at her right that young man was the most correct individual in the matter of clothes deportment and small talk she had ever seen she thought of his splendid father who had started life as a bootblack. I wonder if he's pleased with his fashion plate son, she pondered. She didn't care for him or his friends. They were not like the jolly boys over at Exmoor who had talked about basketball and football and swapped confidences regarding Latin and Greek in that awful French literature examination and what this professor was like and what the prexy said or was supposed to have said and so on. 
it was all college gossip but molly enjoyed it and contributed her share eagerly she tried a little of it on brother willie are you taking up higher math this year mr stewart she asked oh after a fashion he answered i don't expect to stay at college after this year i'm going to paris to finish off molly wondered what higher math after a fashion really meant at the concert later it was a relief to find herself next to professor green who had scarcely looked in her direction all through dinner at first she felt a little embarrassed sitting next to the professor who was a great man at wellington she began silently to admire the packed audience of young girls in light dresses with a generous sprinkling of young men in evening clothes you'll probably be a member of the club next year miss brown the professor was saying i'm sure you must sing i am surprised they have not found it out by this time next winter you must i doubt if i am here next winter interrupted molly and then blushed furiously and bit her lip she wished she had not made that speech is anything going to happen that will keep you from coming to college next winter he asked glancing at the violets how can i tell what will happen she answered childishly then why not come back next year because because she began oh here they come she interrupted herself to say as the members of the glee club filed slowly out and took their seats aren't they sweet in their white dresses very answered the professor but what's this about next year it was just idle talk wasn't it no no whispered molly for the first number was about to begin hasn't mr blount told you anything why no that is nothing about you what on earth didn't you have a list of the stockholders you mean of the square deal mine he asked in entire amazement yes i have a list but what of it my mother's name is there mrs mildred carmichael brown great heavens groaned the professor then he sunk far down in his seat and buried his face in his program jenny wren opened the concert with this song which suited her high bird-like voice to perfection oh i wish i were a tiny brownie bird from out the south settled among the alder holts and twittering by the stream i would put my tiny tail down and put up my little mouth and sing my tiny life away in one melodious dream i would sing about the blossoms and the sunshine and the sky and the tiny wife i mean to have in such a cozy nest and if someone came and shot me dead why then i could but die with my tiny life and tiny song just ended at their best there was something so moving about the little song that molly felt she could have melted into a fountain of tears like undine and she was obliged to smile and smile and pretend that her heart wasn't breaking because her tiny life and tiny song at wellington her beloved wellington were soon to come to an end the professor too was stirred he glanced once at molly's smiling lips and tearful eyes and blew his nose violently then again he contemplated the program with great interest during the intermission molly and will stewart went visiting down the aisle half the audience was moving about talking to the other half and the hall was filled with the buzz of laughter and conversation i love it i love it molly kept repeating to herself there couldn't be anything more perfect than college oh do i have to give it up hey miss molly called annie mclean in a nearby seat while judy and nance and george theodore green were waving violently to her and lawrence upton was shaking hands with her and assuring her that the dinner had been a failure because she hadn't been there fortunately judith was well out of earshot behind the scenes the williams sisters from across the aisle were calling in one voice molly come and meet our brother john margaret wakefield causing a sensation with her distinguished father and enduring the gaze of the entire audience with the calmness of one reared in the public eye detained her for a moment to introduce her to the famous politician a real bell said miss grace green to her brother leaning across two seats to speak to him is one who is just as popular with women as with men and miss molly brown of kentucky appears to be a general favorite the professor looked at his sister absently apparently he hadn't heard a word she said he was saying to himself i think i'll let the tenors sing that little lyric that begins eyes like the skies in summer after a while the delightful affair was over and molly feeling immensely happy in spite of her anxious heart had been escorted to queen's 
professor edwin green hastening into his room flung his hat in one direction and his coat in another and sat down at his desk without an instant's hesitation he seized a pencil and the first scrap of paper he found and began to write dear richard i know that your cares are many but get to work on the score of the opera i find that by working at night for a week i shall be able to finish the last act and make all the changes you suggested we must launch the thing now i have overcome all scruples as you call them and i want nothing more than to get the opera into some manager's hands if you think that Blum and Starks will take it up, you had better see them at once. My name may be used, and everything that goes with it in the way of previous unimportant literary efforts. It's unusual, of course, for a professor of English literature to write a comic opera, but the very unusualness may give it some publicity and help the thing along. I have made one change without conferring, given the tenor lover the baritone villain's song, Eyes Like the Skies in Summer. Write something very pretty for that, will you, old man? The money we may make on this will help some in the present critical family situation. I understand that there have been a good many failures in light opera this winter, and the managers are looking for good things. It may be that we shall strike at the psychological moment. Yours, E.G. The August professor then wrote two other letters, one to a firm of bankers and one to his publishers at last getting into an old dressing gown and some very rusty slippers lighting a long black cigar and drawing his student's lamp nearer he took an immense roll of manuscript from a drawer and fell to work it was three o'clock before he turned in for three hours of troubled sleep end of chapter seven Chapter 8 of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. A Japanese Spread One morning, every girl at Queen's discovered by her plate at the breakfast table a strange rice paper document some twelve inches in length and very narrow as to width rolled compactly on a small stick what's this demanded margaret wakefield unrolling her scroll and regarding it with the legal eye of an attorney perusing documentary evidence across the top of the scroll swung a gay little row of japanese lanterns done in delicate watercolors and in characters strangely japanese was inscribed the following invitation greetings from otoyo sen your honorable presence is requested on saturday evening at the insignificant fate in the unworthily apartment of otoyo sen otoyo muchly flattered by joyful acceptance fortunately the little japanese girl overcome by shyness after this rash venture had not appeared at breakfast and was spared the mirthful expressions on the faces of the girls around the table well of all the funny children laughed molly nance let's offer her our room she can't get the crowd into her little place of course said nance agreeable to anything her roommate might suggest not a single girl declined the quaint invitation and formal acceptances were sent that very day otoya was so excited and happy over these missives that she seemed to be in a state of semi-exaltation for the better part of a week she rushed to the village and sent off a telegram and before saturday morning received at least a dozen mysterious boxes by express they were piled one on top of the other in her room like an oriental pyramid and no one was permitted to see their contents all offers of assistance were refused the day of the party otoya wished to carry out her ideas in her own peculiar way and needed only a stepladder if it was not asking too much would the beautiful and kind friends not enter their room until that evening removing all things needful in the way of books and clothes to judy's room the beautiful and kind friends good-naturedly absented themselves from their apartment from ten in the morning to seven thirty that evening molly spent the afternoon in the library studying and nance called on mrs mclean and drank a cup of tea and ate a buttered scone while she cast an occasional covert glance in the direction of andy jr's photograph on the mantel it was well before eight o'clock when the inquisitive guests assembled and there were at least twenty of them for otoyo's acquaintance was large and numbered girls from all four classes they met downstairs in a body and then marched up to the third story together let's give her a serenade before we knock suggested judy and they sang 
the sweetest girl in wellington is o to yo any name could be fitted into this convenient and ingenious song otoyo flung open the door and stood smiling before them her manner was the very quintessence of hospitality she wore a beautiful embroidered kimono and her hair was fixed japanese fashion even her shoes were japanese and she carried a little fan which she agitated charmingly to express her excited emotions all her english forsook her in the excitement of greeting her guests and she could only repeat over and over again a toyo delightedly a toyo delightedly well i never ejaculated nance entering her old familiar room now transformed into a gay japanese bazaar is this the parent of all the umbrella family demanded judy pointing to an enormous parasol swung in some mysterious manner from the centre of the ceiling and resembling a large fish swimming among a numerous small fry of lanterns the divans were spread with japanese covers and over the white dimity curtains were hung cotton crepe ones of pale blue with the pink cherry blossom design in one corner stood a vase from which poured the incense of smoking joss sticks funny little handleless cups were ranged on the table and lacquered trays of candied fruits rice cakes and other indescribable japanese meat sweets as otoyo had called them the little hostess flew about the room exactly as the three little maids did in the mikado waving her fan and bowing profoundly to her guests presently sitting cross-legged on the floor she sang a song in her own language accompanying herself on a curious stringed instrument a kind of japanese banjo she was in fact the funniest queerest most captivating little creature ever seen she loaded her guests with souvenirs little lacquered boxes fans and diminutive toys i feel as if i were a belle at a grand cotillion with all these lovely favors exclaimed jessie lynch of course you would always be laden with favors said judy that is if you could get all your bows to come to the same cotillion you are like the sailor who had a lass in every port i strongly suspect you of having an admirer in every prominent city in the country jessie laughed and dimpled no she said i stopped at the rocky mountains otoyo who had been listening closely to this dialogue suddenly bethought herself of a new sensation she had provided for her friends which she was about to forget oh she cried i nearly forgetting american girl love fortune telling so do japanese you like to have your fortune told she asked cocking her head on one side like a little bird and blinking at jessie would she cried a dozen ironical voices i hope it's nothing disagreeable and there's no bad luck in it said jessie drawing a slip of paper from a flat shiny box but it's all in japanese she added with much disappointment otoyo will translate it won't you you cunning little sugar lump asked molly everybody choose and then i will make into english said the small busy hostess flying from one to another on her marshmallow soles me first of all cried the eager jessie i had first draw otoyo took the slip and holding it under a lantern translated in a high funny voice he happy who fish for one and catch him then fish for many and catch none the wild whoop of joy that went up at this unexpectedly appropriate statement made the lanterns quiver and the teacups rattle some of the others were not so appropriate but they were all very amusing mabel hinton who had been nicknamed old maid the year before grew in which announced your daughters will make good matches the girls laughed till the tears ran down their cheeks at this prediction and mabel was quite teased i'd like to know why i shouldn't have a family of marriageable daughters some day she exclaimed blinking at them with near-sighted eyes while she wiped the moisture from her large round glasses nance's fortune was a very sentimental one and caused her to blush as red as a rose love will not change neither in the cold winter time nor in the warm springtime under the cherry blossoms when the moon is bright oh thou blushing maiden cried judy canst look us in the eye after this molly's was rather comforting to her troubled and unquiet heart look for clear weather when the sky is blackest of all the mottoes judy's was the funniest if thy husband beat thee give him a smile smile indeed exclaimed that young woman when the laughter had died down i'll just turn the tables on him and beat him back otoyo 
american young lady quite capable of giving honorable husband a good trouncing with a black snake whip otoyo opened her eyes at this it was doubtful whether she could appreciate the humor of her mottoes but she enjoyed hearing the girls laugh she realized they must be having a good time if they laughed like that really genuine side-shaking laughter and no lip smiles for politeness sake who's heard the news about judith blount asked one of the williamses after the party had broken up and only the queen's girls remained molly and judy and nance exchanged telegraphic glances they had been careful to keep secret what Mrs. Keene had written her daughter, and they were curious to know just how much the others knew on the subject, which was now always uppermost, at least in Molly's mind. She sublet her apartment, furnished to that rich freshman from New York whose father's worth a fortune a minute from gold mines and oil wells, and she, I mean Judith, is taking the empty singleton here. You don't mean it, cried a chorus of voices it seems to me i heard that a mr blount lost a lot of money observed margaret it must have been her father how are the mighty fallen exclaimed edith williams i should think she'd have gone anywhere rather than here she couldn't get in any of the less expensive places unless she had taken a room over the post office in the village poor judith ejaculated jessie i've known it for a week to save her life, Molly could not keep a tiny little barbed thought from piercing her mind. Is it fair for Judith to stay at college when I have to leave? Has she any right to the money that's paying her tuition? Molly turned quickly and began gathering up the debris from the tea tables. Anything to get that bitter notion out of her head. Let's be awfully nice to her girls, she said presently. I'm sure she's terribly unhappy remember what success we had with francis andrews last year just through a little kind treatment judith is a different subject altogether said margaret argumentatively she has such a dreadful temper you can never tell when it's going to break loose with the goddess of war sitting among them at this moment nobody dared betray by the flick of an eyelash that there were others whose tempers were rather uncertain only jessie observed well margaret dear you got the better of her that time at the ledges, temper or no temper. I doubt if she takes to poverty as a duck to water, here put in Judy. She'll make a very impatient tutor, and I'd hate to have her black my boots. She might throw them at my head. She is certainly not subdued by her reverses, remarked Jessie. She's just like a caged animal. I never saw anything to equal her. I went over there this afternoon, and she was packing. She almost pitched me out of the room of course it's very luxurious at beta phi house but her little room here isn't to be scorned it's really quite pretty with lovely paper and matting and chintz curtains and wicker chairs suddenly a wave of indignation swept over molly nobody had ever seen her look as she looked now burning spots of color on her cheeks and her eyes black what right has she how dare she she should be thankful she burst out incoherently then she stamped both feet up and down like an angry child and flung herself face down on the couch in an agony of tears it was a kind of mental tempest resembling one of those sudden storms which come with a flash of lightning a roaring crash of thunder and then a downpour of rain why mary carmichael washington brown exclaimed judy kneeling beside poor molly whatever has come over you little otoyo was so frightened that she hid behind a japanese screen while the other girls sat dumb with amazement the williams girls were intensely interested and margaret always consistent and logical in her decisions knew very well that there was something serious back of it please forgive me said molly presently wiping her eyes and sitting up as limp as a rag i'm awfully sorry to have spoiled the evening like this i didn't mean it it just slipped out of me before i knew it was coming why you old sweetness exclaimed the affectionate judy of course you are forgiven i guess you ought to be allowed a few outbursts but what caused it i think it was nervousness answered molly evasively but the girls began to realize that it was not entirely nervousness it occurred to them now that molly had been preoccupied and strangely silent for some time occasionally she gave way to forced gaiety twice she had started on walks changed her mind and come back without giving any excuse except that she was a little tired it was in fact a condition that had come about so gradually that they were hardly aware that they had noticed it until the sudden breakdown she's dead tired and not to get to bed this minute remarked nance caressing her friend's hand 
dearest molly said jesse who was moved by a gentle sympathy always for those in trouble go to bed and get a good rest it was just nice and human of you to get mad once in a thousand years and we love you all the better for it they were good friends all of them molly felt as they kissed her or pressed her hand good night while nance and judy hastened to clear off the divan and put up the windows to blow out the heavy incense scented air it was otoyo however who brought the tears back to poor molly's eyes dear beautiful Miss brown she said you must not think it will come wrong it will come right i feel surely what is it nance whispered judy after they had got their friend to bed nance shook her head heaven knows she answered but it's something and it must be serious judy or she never would have let go like that end of chapter eight